Okay, so I've been asked to do a video on the sacroiliac joint. Um, some people struggle with the SI joint. Um, it isn't easy um, to get it to move. So they can sometimes just completely ignore it altogether um, and they keep sort of banging away at the lumbosacral joint. So I just wanted to show you one of the ways that I use. There are many ways to adjust uh, the SI joint. I know there's loads of different um, thought processes on it, but I'll show you the, one of the ways that I use um, which hopefully you might find helpful. As always, before you adjust any joint, you've got to assess it, you've got to take the case history, you've got to know what you're doing, your patient's got to be good, you've got to get your contacts and everything correct before you put any sort of impulse through the joint. Okay, so when um, we look at the SI joint, um, when we're looking at the contact point, there's different contact points. Um, what we're going to contact today is going to be the lateral side of the uh, sacroiliac joint. Um, the contact is going to be on the ilium, it's going to be at the upper pole. So when you find the PSIS, we're then going to come just slightly lateral and apply our contact here. Now we know we can come down to the lower pole, we know we can make a contact point down on the spine here, but we're coming up to here. We're going to use our fleshy piezy form and we're going to put our contact right on there. So we're not putting it on there because we're going to push the whole thing over. We want to actually get this movement through the sacroiliac joint if we can. The other thing we're going to do, which I'll show you, is before we put any sort of thrust or impulse through, we need to put a little bit of a gap. That's our secret. A little bit of a gap and then when we apply our controlled forces, we're more likely to be successful. Okay? Okay, as always, it's important to get your setup correct. If your setup isn't correct, then often um, things aren't going to work. So make sure your table is at the correct height. The table, you need to have a table that goes up and down. You don't want it too low, and at the same time, you don't want it high. Um, certainly not too high, because you're going to end up having to sort of try and get over the over the top of the patient. So this table is roughly about the height of my knees. This is a typical sort of table that's about sort of 52 centimetres in width, so we need to bring our patient a little bit closer to us. Okay, so first things first is we're going to put that arm into that position. Now we are going to start to take out some of the slack, and all we're going to do is just pull that bottom shoulder through just a bit. Okay, so we're not super winding it up, it's just clearing that shoulder and then we'll just get the patient to hold on just very gently to their elbow. The bottom leg is straight and the top leg is bent. Okay, And then again, what I want is probably about that much clearance of their top leg off the edge of the table, and I'll show you why in a moment. So just scoop the patient forwards. If they're a heavy patient, ask them to do it. Okay and then we're in that position from there. Okay, so this top leg, what we're going to do with this top leg, as you can see, the top leg has cleared the table, okay, because we need to use that. Now what I'm going to do is what we need to do is we need to push back that way. So we want to create a shearing force and down, a gapping force. So if you think of that ilium, it's going to go back and it's going to go up before we put any sort of force through it. So we use our knee, and we can just get our knee into there. So we're gonna push down, back, and then fix it against our knee, and then turn and push down hard on that. So what's happening here is that is now gapping, okay? It's gapping open that way, so then when I apply my effort or my impulse, then the SI joint is more likely to gap or move slightly. Okay, so once again, make sure that leg is cleared. We want to go down and back, pin that against my knee, and then turn my body, and I'm leaning against that. That's creating a strong, powerful shearing force. As you can see, this leg is pointing that way. I'm not that way, I'm that way. So I'm pointing up the table because I'm going to use this leg to drop. Okay, so 
with that leg in the position from the other side, now we need to find the PSIS. So you all know how to do that. Find the PSIS. Just come in fear a little bit and then lateral. Okay, so that's where we want to be. Okay, I don't want to be necessarily in the sulcus or lower because I'm going to be on the sacrum. Okay, I'm going to end up pushing the whole pelvis forwards and probably rattling the lumbar sacral joint. If you do manage to move the sacroiliac joint, the sound, you won't ever forget the sound, it's like a big clonk. It's a bit like the OA joint, it's a clonk. It's not a big click or a little sort of high pitch click, it's a clonk. Okay, and you'll know you've moved it. Obviously you're going to reassess it. The patient's going to feel hopefully a lot better. So, find the PSIS, come inferior, go lateral. Now, the way I tend to do it is I tend to take a little bit of the skin slack out, use my Pisces form, come in and then turn and have my hand or whole of my hand facing up that way. Okay? Now, I know some people will do that. That's absolutely fine. I tend to prefer like that, to have my whole hand over the contact. Okay, so I'm taking a little bit of the skin slack out. Now, what I do is we squeeze. So we're using a compression. So this is squeezing all the fluid out and taking out all the slack. I don't personally tend to use too much of this. This is a rotary. Sometimes we might use a little bit of traction. Patients can often find that a little uncomfortable and then you can end up losing the actual movement up, say, through here. So we tend to squeeze, like we're squeezing a ball together, okay, to bring our forces together. So come in, come round. Now I'm facing that way. So I've twisted my whole body, roll the patient as one, and it's there. There, you can feel the tension building already. And then from there, it's a drop, a drop down. Okay, it's not a one of those, or it's not a one of those because the whole thing will just roll forward and you'll lose it and it'll be uncomfortable. So it's a squeeze, it's a turn, and it's a drop, a drop. And when I mean drop, what I'm doing is actually lunging forwards. So something that you can practice uh, in your technique is to drop, drop, drop. Okay, too many people do this, you'll end up hurting your shoulder. Some people try and do it with their arm. That's okay if it's a very small patient, but once you get some of these big patients, you're gonna really ruin your arm trying to do things like that. So you're squeezing all your forces together, and you're creating that tension, and then you're dropping on top of it, remembering that you've got that gap, which is the secret to success in this particular manipulation. So, just very quickly, one more time, make sure the patient is close to you. This arm is here, this shoulder comes through, and then we're just placing that there, okay? I tend to circle the wrist, <clears throat> we'll bend up the knee, straighten that one out, draw the patient over, okay, let that knee clear the table, probably about that much, push down and back to gap that joint, rest that against your knee, apply pressure down and then turn your whole body, find your PSIS, come lateral, inferior lateral, the whole hand over it, roll the patient, get yourself into a good position, squeeze, and then it's a drop, a drop, a drop. Okay, and what you'll most likely hear, if you've assessed them correctly, is a nice big clunk. Then you can reassess with your motion palpation and any other special tests that you might want to use. So I hope that's helpful. Leave me some comments. Let me know if you want to see anything else. There's lots of other ways we could do some pull moves, um, but leave me a comment. Make sure you subscribe and share. Okay, thank you.